Hello, everybody. I'm Damon T. Jeeves, a composer, introduce, composer, media artist, also an uh, engineer and researcher, currently doing my PhD in the field of uh, virtual acoustics. And yeah, I would consider my roots in uh, algorithmic composition. And in the last years, um, yeah, I got into the field of uh, artificial intelligence um, as I felt like it's some kind of the state of the art of uh, algorithms uh, you could use in uh, artistic production. I want to start with uh, this picture. Many of you might know this is, uh, was like recently, uh, or it went recently quite uh, viral in, um, in all these uh, social networks and uh, mass media um, blogs and stuff like this. It's the portrait of Edmond Bellamy, um, created by uh, an artist collective uh, called Obvious, and it was created by a gun. Uh, we have heard uh, already or have seen, um, yeah, uh, results from a gun uh, earlier. This or in this uh, last uh, talk, uh, gun stands for a generative adversarial uh, network. And I don't want to go much into technical de uh, details during my talk, but um, this one I wanted to point out uh, because it's quite interesting. Um, a GAN model consists of uh, two neural networks. Uh, there's one uh, a generator and uh, one descriptor. And um, yeah, so um, we have like two... Um, neural networks um, and some kind of uh, conflict where the generator tries to fool the second one uh, that the synthetic image is a real one. And um, so in this process, uh, we don't have like a human to decide whether the result is like uh, good enough to be or looks like a, a real uh, picture or not. So um, so everything was left to a neural network. So this might be the first point for the neural networks in this uh, game. The um, picture was sold by the um, famous uh, auction house uh, Christie's and they claim that it was like uh, the first picture uh, ever sold by an auction house. Um, if you have seen this uh, in in various uh, news, there was also like claimed, okay, this was like the first picture of an artificial intelligence sold, and um, yeah, I'm not so sure about it. And there's also like a um, huge uh, controversy going on because it seems like that uh, the creators of these pictures uh, have used like an uh, open source code by Robbie Barrett and also like used uh, pre-trained uh, models from him. So it seems to be some kind of copy and paste work here. And um, yeah, and I would also say that it's like uh, not at all the first picture of an artificial intelligence sold. So I will go to my next slide. Here we have uh, Google Deep Dream. Um, yeah, this came up in 2015. And in the link uh, beneath this, we also see, okay, so Google was also like selling uh, pictures done by this Google Deepream algorithm uh, on an auction. And um, so the Bellamy is not uh, really the first one ever sold. And um, yeah, why I pointed, uh, pointed Google Deep Dream here out is because I think it was some kind of important milestone when it comes to um, artificial intelligence and arts. So if you also Google artificial intelligence arts, uh, you will uh, have like this picture as one of the first. And um, what it makes so special is that um, after this, there was like some kind of hype where um, there were many um, yeah, neural networks created to, to uh, yeah, generate art, and all of them were like based on style transfer, where the uh, network was trained like with uh, pictures of a specific artist, and then it could like um, yeah, 
um, recreate the style on various uh, other pictures um, it was shown. And uh, this one was uh, different because um, it was basically a model um, which was uh, yeah, created for uh, object recognition, like trained with a um, zoo model with uh, different animals. And the programmers of this model um, wanted to invert the progress to see, okay, what's, uh, what, what's the things the artificial intelligence sees during this recognition uh, process. And then it be, uh, then it's like result uh, has like this kind of results where you see like um, yeah like some faces of animals or parts of animals um, wh wh which the artificial intelligence thinks or sees like in in other objects. So we have like this uh, paradoia effect uh, here recreated by an artificial intelligence, which is like very interesting because um, this is some kind of phenomena which is like, or was uh, before limited to humans. And here it was like recreated um, by an artificial intelligence and it was never meant to uh, create art. So um, the programmers just wanted to see, okay, what's like in this hidden layers of this uh, neural network and um, the reception of the results was uh, done so by the audience and they told, okay, so this really looks like art and uh, then it became art. And so why the uh, Bellamy was so, um, or got so famous or so much attention, I would say like it uh, goes back like to a small detail here. It's maybe hard to see, I can, yeah. I can zoom in. Uh, the picture was signed um, with the creation of the min-max pro uh, problem uh, which where the guns are based uh, on. And um, so the, the, the um, artist collective um, instrumentalized this uh, neural network as the artist. So um, maybe it was, yeah, not, also, I think not the first one in fine arts, um, where you have like this neural, uh, neural network with a specific name and it was presented as the artist and not like the programmers or the people uh, be behind it. How does it look? Um, ah, yeah, no. Um, so, there's also like, um, yeah, I wanted to, to point out Frida Nake because um, we have like here some uh, example of um, yeah generative um, uh, yeah generative art, which is uh, goes back quite some years, and um, I wanted to point it out because I have seen Frida Nake in a talk, and he was like a big critic of uh, whether an um, algorithm can be creative or not, and I think this is like a very important question. Um, which is also like my motivation when it comes to working with uh, neural networks and other uh, algorithms which can be uh, yeah, considered as artificial intelligence. So how does it look in music? I have here some quotes of um, famous composers uh, working with um, or about their work uh, with algorithms. Uh, the first one is uh, Xenakis. Um, he told, I feed the machine with a well-defined dense network of formulas uh, with its own chain which effectively makes up the programs. Then you fix the initial data which you put into a, a kind of black container. The machine works and throws out certain results. So Xenakis later on have like this bunch of results and then he selects like which uh, results like fits uh, best like from his aesthetic point of view. So I'm quite glad that it was already mentioned before. We have some kind of paradigm shift uh, here. So the artists become more uh, of a curator. And um, the second quote is by Gottfried M. Koenig. Uh, Not everything the computer composes finds my applause. That's why I've written a program that calculates any number of variation of each uh, section. At the desk, I would uh, have to work for many days, maybe weeks, to learn all the consequences of a rule set. 
The programmer will throw out the results in a few minutes. This makes the work easier and it extends my knowledge, my imagination. So uh, Koenig also like does the same. So uh, he uses the algorithm as some kind of uh, co-worker which uh, presents some kind of results and then he later on uh, picks the ones he likes most. David Cope, uh, also like one of the pioneers when it comes to um, composing with um, artificial intelligence, um, said uh, computers can be creative as long as I can be creative using computers. So here we have like um, a very different approach when it comes uh, to the levels. Uh, so uh, from the David Cope quote, it's, uh, yeah, it seems to be more like, um, he's not or doesn't have like this point of view where the um, uh, machine is only like some kind of um, yeah calculator which uh, calculates uh, variations of sequences or something it becomes more like a co-worker um, and um, yes David Cope was also I think the first one or maybe the first one I know which created some kind of um, artificial intelligent avatar. Um, Emily Howell here, um, the first album was released in 2009 where David Cope created like this artificial intelligence composer under its own name and released works um, done by it. You can listen maybe to a little bit of it. So this was one of the examples which is not like quite like some kind of obvious style imitation from uh, composers the uh, network was uh, teach with. And um, yeah, so what it makes special is, okay, so we have like some kind of um, avatar person here, Emily Howell, and he tries to create some uh, novel um, compositions with it. And if we uh, look at the date, it's like uh, 2009, and we, we compare it like to, um, yeah, today's LSTM networks of uh, Google Magenta or something, it really sounds awesome, I think, for this time. And yeah, some other approach to work with uh, artificial intelligence or other kind of um, Algorithm networks is does not only lie in the oh, composition of the network itself. It can also be um, like on cooperative ways, like a duet or some kind of it. So here we have like example of the OMAX system by IRCAM. I think it first came out in 2004. And uh, they use it quite often, I think, in the context of jazz music, but also other styles. And um, here the algorithm, like, um, it um, um, plays together with a human. So the piano we hear are, um, is generated by the computer. The results are sound quite nice, I think, and especially if we look like at the date also, uh, 2004, 
And if we compare it to some newer approach, here we have uh, AI Do It by Google Magenta. It was cool to see the system. system I didn't expect. In a creative feedback where people can improvise with the AI the on a keyboard. It's also fun to return something coherent from any input they give it. Here you can see some results. I made all of the code open source, and the neural net that I'm using is from Google's open source Magenta project. So anyone can grab it and train their own net. I wanted to put this experiment out there just as an example of the many kinds of things you can make with machine learning and music, and I'm really excited to see what other people do. You can play with it at g.co. It was cool to. It picks up on stuff like. No, no, he's just talking to me. I had some friends try it out. But it I think you all got the idea. So we have like this call and response system here going on. The AI is like responding on um, the input from the human. And yeah, like for me, it doesn't seem like so impressive like uh, as the OMAX. Um, but yeah, sure, it's like a completely different uh, thing behind it. What's uh, interesting here about this, okay, we have like some kind of um, point of view where the human is like on side with the uh, artificial intelligence. So, um, and now we came like to my personal motivation and um, how I work with this. Um, I will start with a piece um, where I use like a very old artificial intelligence, the cybernetic poet by Ray Kurzweil, um, which um, yeah generates uh, poet from uh, text uh, it was trained uh, with, and we have like some kind of avatar um, video going on. It's um, Scarlett Johansson um, generated with uh, the Google Deep Dream algorithm and we have some electronic music which is triggered by notes uh, composed by uh, LSTM network from Google Magenta. I will play a little bit. artificial intelligence like on a big screen above two humans and the humans uh, become more of a kind of um, interface between this uh, free uh, AI network. What I felt about this was, okay, so we have like this uh, free AI networks here, but still um, everything which you can see and hear is like completely based on decisions I made. So um, like the whole atmosphere it creates is like totally um, influenced by my own personal decisions and Still, my goal is something like we have seen in uh, Google's Deep Dream, where we have like this um, this new artistic style, the um, AI network created itself, and um, yeah. So I was thinking about whether I um, I may be not ready to uh, left like all my uh, decisions uh, to the machine because I can uh, or I. I think uh, it would be totally possible to 
leave as many decisions to the mas machine as it's possible. And uh, just to have some kind of influence on this. So I will come to the next piece. It's uh, the conductor's philosophy too, uh, where you have a conductor um, controlling uh, ensemble of uh, four laptops playing a polyphonic uh, composition made by an LSTM network. I will play it only short because it uh, wasn't like a very nice run through. Data is synthesized by variation of the synthesizer. Uh, what I've done here basically, okay, so I've trained um, the neural network um, with a huge um, corpus of MIDI data like not a specific style, not a specific composer, but like all the MIDI data I could find like from various kinds of music, from folk, rock, classical music, from different ages and um, yeah, different composers. And my idea was, okay, here um, the artificial intelligence has like all this knowledge about this music which uh, has been done. And here can like extract what it's um, the most interesting features of all this music, all this world music ever done for this AI. Um, but still, there's a lot of decisions on selecting uh, the works and uh, selecting how it was uh, synthesized and stuff like this. And it still felt like more of a piece of mine than, uh, than a piece of an AI. So the next thing, it's uh, the cargo cult. I will play this uh, here tomorrow night. And um, here I wanted to find some way uh, where I can leave even more freedom to the AI. So um, I created like a genetic, uh, <laughs> sorry, a genetic programming uh, model which is also like uh, part of uh, or what we call artificial intelligence, um, where I have defined uh, esoteric um, language for the AI and uh, lets the AI program source code um, for this audiovisual language. So what we will see is um, the AI live coding in its own um, yeah, programming language. And all I can do is some kind of try to influence this AI by giving feedback. Normally, uh, this genetic algorithms work with a fitness function uh, where the uh, algorithm calculates um, yeah, how much the result uh, equals to the um, result or specific um, result uh, the programmer was uh, or it, intended by the programmer. Um, here the AI uh, doesn't have some kind of fitness function. It's like all uh, just uh, by the feedback of uh, me during stage. And still, the, so well, my approach here was uh, to leave more um, space for the AI to make its uh, own decisions. Uh, yet still, I think um, the aesthetic created by this, still so like very influenced by me. And so I still doesn't have my personal answer to how to have something like the dream for music. Um, and I'm not pretty sure whether it's like uh, technical limitations so that we still, the AI is like not autonomous or free enough or the models we have um, for AIs um, to make all this uh, aesthetic uh, decisions by their own. However, it's me like some kind of putting pressure on the AI so I can still write my own name under the works created by the AI. 
Yeah, so I wanted to close my talk with this and go to the, or like some kind of open discussion. What do you think about this thing, whether we should leave more freedom to the AI or still see it as some kind of tools uh, we use like for our own artistic expression or starting to create AIs which, uh, yeah, do everything by their own. So thank you very much, Damian. Thank and you. now you perfectly introduce uh, the questions. So I'm wondering whether there are some questions coming from the audience. Is this, uh, is this an actual question? <laughs> no. no, there was no question. Over there, there's one question. <laughs> okay, I think one and then two. You take orange. I like orange. Um, thank you. That was an interesting talk. Um, I wonder whether the the comparison that you seem to be making in terms of trying to work out um, the extent of freedom and the controls and the value, the aesthetic value of outcome, is the right one. <laughs> and that is that, of course, with the the deep dream images, mm -hmm. they're a, a static snapshot in time, right? So they, they can, it can take as long as it likes to generate that. And then we get this image, which is a, a concrete fixed thing, as trippy as it might be. But as soon as we come to music or any performance situation, we have a time vector, mm -hmm. which of course complicates it sure. many fold. <laughs> and, and so I guess I'm just wondering whether whether this is a kind of, because it seems to me you're putting these Google Dream images up to say, perhaps what you're saying is they're aesthetically interesting and I want to find something that's as aesthetically interesting. But but then how we deal with that temporal vector seems to be a key challenge in music that's, I think, you know, we've seen a lot of work in that and, and I think OMAX deals with that quite well and mm -hmm. others don't and a lot of the Google stuff really doesn't it's kind yeah. of like those web examples are terrible music right yes. and a <laughs> moment might be fine but then the next note and the next note is horrible and you're just like okay it's a computer program written by a programmer not a composer mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if you have any insight into thinking about how we deal with the complexity of that time vector not really so I don't have like um, yeah any ideas or solutions with this. Um, what what I wanted to say I think uh, maybe it's even more important when it comes to um, AIs creating some kind of uh, own aesthetic point of view is um, the symbolic domain. So most of the networks still uh, work in some yeah. MIDI data um, domain and I think this is uh, due to limitations of the hardware we have but um, once I mean there's, there's also uh, already so much going on um, on the audio domain where we have like all these neural networks um, not doing MIDI data or not that are not trained on MIDI data but um, yeah, like instantly we, the results are something you can hear. And then there's uh, this layer of interpretation um, is gone. So I think because this is something like um, I as an artist always have to make uh, my decisions. So I think like the, the showstopper is not really like the problems we have like on, on time with neural networks, like more, okay, so... Um, we need something which um, outputs audio and also we need something which uh, can put some semantic values into this work like also um, AIs that create some kind of concept or their own interpretation of this work and stuff like this. So I think it's more of an um, or it's not, not so much of a technical um, problem I think. 
Okay, so your question is answered. Then I'm wondering whether there are some more questions. Ah, yeah, over there, there was one question already. Um, you mentioned that um, it's coming, the ideas are coming out of yourself. Yeah. I don't trust you. Maybe, yeah. So. Yeah. Because if I look at this picture, for example, mm -hmm. it got inspired by uh, Van Gogh very much. Yeah, yeah, sure. And it's, I think yeah. if you um, go on into our times, you should deal with motives coming out from 2018, but not from 17, I don't know, from um, the night, sc night sky night from Arles. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, to make this um, clear, this is not a result for me. What we can see here, it's like, um, yeah, one of the Google Deep Dream things you can see on the internet. So, um, yeah, but um, the other thing, um, I'm, I'm also like not sure if I fool myself that I need to make all this decision and put all these uh, things in to have some kind of interesting uh, result from the machine or I'm just not brave enough to have like the machine doing all these decisions by itself and then present it to the uh, audience. So this is like the conflict um, I'm talking about when it goes to me against the machine. So it's always some kind of... Uh, you know, uh, trying who gets the upper hand of the final results, whether it's me making like all this decision and putting like a concept into it, or it's like uh, the AI doing all this uh, decision uh, on the results. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, you, you addressed uh, some question or just the topic of uh, the time mm -hmm. uh, and progression of of the events in time, basically. Yes. And I wonder if uh, it will, could be a solution to however uh, combine uh, rules, rules with AI uh, generators, basically. Mm -hmm. To combine uh, certain, uh, to understand the AI as a generator of, of material in a certain uh, texture condition, mm -hmm. and then uh, either filter it or, or give the rule as an input for the creation uh, as an additional hint, uh, uh, or if that wouldn't be a solution of that problem somehow. I think maybe even like David Cope and others did this also already. Like I think the first uh, results from David Cope with uh, Amy, um, it was experiments uh, with musical intelligence. They were all like rule based and um, they were also like uh, very good results like with time progressions and stuff like this. But my question here is um, why we want to put our understanding of time or how a musical piece uh, should develop from time uh, to the results of the AI and why not leave this uh, question and the answer to it to the AI itself. So um, that's also something like we try to push like our understanding of the structure of a piece or how it should uh, progress through time uh, to the models of the AI. So but Maybe it could be more interesting just uh, to leave it uh, this, this kind of decisions like also to the AI, because this is like also what was done with uh, Deep Dream. So there were no artistic um, intention behind it, and no um, programmer thought, okay, so when it uh, or we want to have something um, that then generates art, and now we have to make like these tweaks to the model. It was just okay. So we want uh, to see what the, um, the, the model sees uh, during his uh, recognition processes, and these are the results. And the people decided, uh, okay, so this is art to me. Over there, there's another question. Uh, so, I so I have two, two questions. Mm -hmm. One is, why is time different? Like, why is it more difficult to manage than other dimensions? And the second one is regarding your 2018 project with the language generation thing. Can you go into a bit more detail about the actual language? Is it Turing complete and what does it actually do? Um, okay, the first question was about why it's so difficult. 
Um, it's, I think, um, most of the problems are solved already, like with uh, convolution networks and uh, like this better LSTM networks. And I think it's all, or the problems uh, we had like maybe two years ago or something uh, were just about the arch uh, architecture of the model. So um, I just to point it out, I'm also like not a researcher on neural networks or stuff like this. I'm also like mostly using like the models uh, people create. And the second question was about the language. And if it's too incomplete, right? Or was there anything? Yeah. So um, as I said, it's some kind of, or I, it's, it's like based on, on some kind of ideas uh, from esoteric language. Um, there was this paper, I think, by Cory Becker. Uh, she wrote about uh, how to use genetic programming um, yeah, for some kind of AI programmer model, and she used uh, BrainFuck. It's, uh, yeah, some symbolic uh, programming language, um, which is too incomplete, um, just to demonstrate um, her uh, results on this AI programmer. And I decided to have some kind of uh, array manipulation language. Okay. So it consists like of a small uh, rule set of uh, symbols where you can put um, or where uh, values are um, directly uh, managed in, in arrays. And then you have some kind of rules uh, to, to manipulate this, uh, the arrays. So the, um, the good thing was that um, it's hard for the AI to uh, program an arrow into it. So it's just a very simple thing. And I have to think about it might be too incomplete, but I'm not really sure. I have to check this out. But um, yeah, maybe it's not. It's like, yeah. It's always also hard to say something's <laughs> too incomplete. There are different definitions of it. But yeah, and uh, what's so special about it's something, um, if you will attend the concert tomorrow, it's something like not a human could program it because I think it will be too complicated with all the symbols and all the values are represented with um, Japanese katana uh, signs. Uh, and yeah. All right, then I think we will leave it um, with this. Thank you very much, Damian, for your talk. Thank mm -hmm. you.